Hello, uh, my name is Amy Worf, and I'm a potter in the Spokane area. I'm also a member of the Artist Cooperative Pottery Place Plus. So today I'm going to show you how I make one of my uh, pottery bowls. It's a bowl that is a perfect size for a large dinner salad or as a medium-sized serving dish. And I'll be showing you step-by-step step how to make that bowl. All right, when you're throwing on the potter's wheel, uh, you have to have the clay the right consistency. Um, you like to be able to make an impression. If the clay is too hard, it gets very difficult to center the clay. If it's too soft, then wh while you're throwing it, you may end up, uh, the pot may end up sagging or getting off center or collapsing. So, so it's very important to have the right consistency. Um, and so to do that, you just work with the clay a little bit to prepare it for, uh, for the throwing process. Um, so what I do is I wedge the clay using this wire. Um, I'll just show you what I do. I cut it and then throw it down. What this does is um, get rid of any air bubbles that might be in the clay because that can be a problem when you're firing uh, or when you're throwing on the potter's wheel also. And then after I've done that a while, I can look and see there's no air bubbles that I can see when I cut the clay. So now I'll knead the clay a little bit. And what the kneading process does is it gets the clay going in a spiral pattern. So that makes it much easier to center the clay on the wheel because it's already turning in that spiral. Okay, and that looks good. So now I'll make a nice ball of clay and let's go over to the wheel then and we'll start throwing the pot. Okay, so here I am at my wheel. I'm getting ready to throw a bowl and I'm real concerned when I throw bowls that as I take the bowl off the wheel, it doesn't get distorted in shape. So most of the bowls that I throw, I throw using what's called a throwing bat, which is um, about a quarter inch thick piece of um, double-sided wall board that um, I use a little bit of clay to stick it to the wheel head. And then there's this, this stuff on that I'll clean off. So that way, once the pot is finished, I can just take this board off and I won't distort the shape of the bowl. Um, a little bit about my setup. I have, um, not all potters do this, but I've found it's very convenient to have a mirror just in front of where I am. Um, otherwise, I would have to bend over like this to see the shape of the pot. And this way I can just look up and look in the mirror and see the shape of the pot. And so that ends up being a little less stress on the back, which is always important too. So we'll get started with the throwing process. So the first step in throwing is to center the clay. Um, this is where I make it so it feels like when my hands are on it feels like it's not even moving it's not wobbling or jiggling from side to side as I'm throwing the clay I always keep it lubricated with water but you do want to use as little water as possible so the clay doesn't get too soft while you're throwing So what I'm doing is I'm pressing down with my one hand and then pushing in from the side with the other hand. And you can see how the cha clay changes shape depending on whether I push more with one hand or the other. And this is important. Um, the minute you start working with the clay, you're determining what the final piece will look like. 
so if I wanted to make, for example, a flat platter, I would push more from the top and start with a much shallower ball of clay in the centered form. But I'm making a more vertical bowl, so now I'm pushing more from the side and bringing that clay up into a more vertical shape. And I can look in my mirror and see that it looks centered and it feels centered. So I'm ready to start making the bowl shape then. Another thing about this is the, this has a certain diameter here. And when I've opened up the pot, this is going to be the widest diameter that it, that it could be. So you have to think the finished pot, how big of a base do I want that finished pot to be? So you're already determining somewhat how the pot is going to look just by the shape of the initial lump that you center on the wheel. So I make a little indentation in the center so I can start opening the pot. Now what I'll do is, there's a lot of ways to open the clay. What I do, what feels good for me, is to put my thumb down there and make the initial opening. And so I'm going to put my thumb in and then I'll just turn the joint of my thumb to open it a little bit at first. And I'm just approximating how far I think I need to go. at this point. I always check the thickness of the bottom. It's really easy to waste a lot of clay by having the bottom too thick. So right now the bottom's a little over a half inch and that's a little bit too thick. So I'm just going to go down a little bit further and then I know that's the thickness that I want. The reason I want it about a half inch thick is because I know I'm going to be cutting a foot ring on the bottom that's about a quarter of an inch thick and then I want the base of the pot to be about a quarter inch so that equals about a half inch or less. Okay so so the bottom of the pot is is the right thickness now but you can see there's a, just a very small area that I've opened up. So now I'm just gonna pull my hand to the side a little bit and open it up to the diameter that I want the flat bottom of the inside of the pot to be. And now I'm smoothing the clay back and forth. Now what this does, I'm pressing down on it. I'm not going any deeper, but what I'm doing is compressing the clay in the bottom of the pot. What this does is keep the bottom of the pot from cracking as the pot dries. Okay, so that looks good. That's nice and smooth. The walls of the pot are very thick at this point. So the first pull that I do to lift the clay up, I just want to make them even. I want to make a nice rounded edge on the top. So that's what I'm doing right now. And just get this nice and rounded and smooth. So now, the, although the walls are still very thick, at least they're an even thickness. Now this is when I switch sponges, I'm just going to be putting a thin skim of water on the clay at this point from now on to keep it lubricated. And I am slowly lifting the walls of the pot. What I'm doing is going down to the wheel head at the bottom with my outside hand and gathering up the clay that's down there. On the inside, I'm pressing out so I don't lose the diameter that I have for the inside of the pot. So you can see the outer hand is, and you can see the loop of clay that I'm bringing up. And I know I'm making a bowl, so with each pull that I do, I'm also expanding out the top of the clay, and that's by pressing more from the inside than from the outside. And 
there's a real tendency to get the top lip of the pot too thin. I try to keep the walls a fairly even thickness. The lip will thin out just naturally as it expands in diameter. So you really don't have to think too much about making a thin lip. And I rest my, I always kind of reinforce the lip at the end of each pull. It helps to keep the pot centered when I do that. I'm pulling up a pot that has fairly straight sides at this point, just to get the basic bowl shape. And my fingers are real sensitive to the thickness of the clay as I'm throwing. I'm trying not to make any thin spots, trying to make it so that the pot is the same thickness from the base all the way up to the top. Um, so now I have a good basic bowl shape. You can see that there's marks on the outside of the pot, finger marks and stuff like that. When I do the final decoration on my piece, I like to start with a nice smooth surface. And so at this point, I'll use some throwing ribs to refine the shape of the pot. This one is a firmer rib and this one is very flexible so I can, I can uh, kind of mold the outside of the pot to that shape. So do a little bit in the bottom. And then I'll just fit this onto and bring it up. And you can see how that smoothed out a lot of the throwing rings in doing that. I, I'm looking in the mirror now and I still don't quite like the shape that I have. So now I'm going to refine the shape a little bit. Okay, and I, I want the lip to flare out just a little bit more. There, that's good. So the final steps are to clean up any slip that's on the outside of the pot. And then I have a piece of leather chamois that I use to smooth the very top edge of the lip. And I find it's easier to cut the piece off if I trim a little bit away from the bottom. So what I'll do is I will cut the pot from the bat, but I'm not going to try to lift it off at this point. I'm just loosening it. And as the pot dries, that'll make it so that the, the clay can move a little bit on the bat because it's been cut away. We'll just set this one aside to dry. Okay, so now the bowl has dried. It's about half dry 
And this is called the leather hard stage. You can see I can pick it up, I can handle it. I'm not distorting the shape of the bowl, but it's still wet enough that I can do things like trim it, I can add handles if I wanted to, I can carve it. So it's, it's still very workable at this stage. I'm going to be first trimming the foot ring on the bottom of the bowl. To do this, I, I use a tool called a Giffen grip, which automatically centers the bowl on the pot and, and has little grips so that the bowl will stay centered as I'm trimming it. Now again, I don't want to distort the shape when I take this pot off of the wheel when it's done trimming. Right now I can pick up the pot fairly easily because there's extra clay on the bottom, so I can hold on to that. But once the foot ring is trimmed, I won't want to pick it up like this. So I've just devised on my own a way to pick up the pot. These are just strips of kind of a soft cotton fabric that I lay across here. And I'll be able to use these to pick up the pot once it's done trimming. Okay, when I'm deciding to trim, the foot ring has a certain diameter and I need to figure out, well, what diameter, or how much clay do I need to trim off? So I look at the inside of the pot and I can see the where the flat part of the base is. And then I can look to the outside of the pot and I can see I want my foot ring to be at the outer edge of that flat part of the base. So I can look at the outside and see, well, to make that happen, I need to trim off probably about a half inch of clay all the way around. Okay, now potters use a lot of different tools to trim their pots. Uh, it's basically what feels good in your hand and what you, you feel like you have good control of. To trim off a bulk quantity of clay, I use a tool like this that I can, once the blade gets worn out, I can put a new blade into there. Um, so I'll start by making sure the top of the pot is level. And then I'm going to start trimming in about a half inch from the outer edge. And I always save my trimmings. Again, that's something that can be reconstituted and, and made into another pot. So, you, so I save the trimmings if I can. Okay, so I've gotten a good bulk of the clay off. And now I'll use a tool that has a smaller end to it. Actually, I use both of these ends, just because I feel like I have a lot more control when I'm, when I'm working with this smaller tool. And I'll be really refine the shape of the foot. You can see I'm making it about a quarter inch high, because I know I have about a half inch. Okay, and now, I'm going to cut away this excess clay here so that there's a nice smooth transition between the wall of the pot and where the foot is. If you don't do this process, many times you end up with a lot of extra clay that adds weight to the piece. Um, I've made my share of two-ton bowls and I work really hard to make the bowl weigh as much as it looks like it should weigh when you pick it up. Okay, so that's um, a nice smooth transaction or trans transition. And then I'll take this steel rib and again, just make it a nice smooth, there, that's good. Okay, now I'm gonna cut the center out. Again, I have about a half inch thickness here that I know about, so I'm going to be cutting down about a, a quarter of an inch and removing the excess clay that's in the center. I like to make my pots 
have an elegant look to them and part of that is uh, having a nice finished bottom to the pot. There are other potters that their pots are more rustic, they have a different style of working with the clay and it's all good, but um, they don't have to go to this degree to finish the bottom of the pots because leaving it flat goes with the style of the rest of the pot, but it would not go with the style of the way I do my pots. Okay, and now I'll smooth out the bottom. This is the point where you could do some little decoration, extra decoration on the bottom if you wanted to, and on some of the designs I do, I make little ridges or a little swirl in the bottom, but I won't do that for this pot. That's not in the design. And I don't know, let's see, as I'm cutting this foot ring, you can see there's a little bit ridge around the edge of the foot ring. It's just the width of the tool. And that will be important when I put the wax on the pot. And I'll explain that at that time. Okay. So the last step is just to sponge everything smooth. And, of course, sign the piece. I always try to make my signature legible. So if someone wanted another piece, they'd know who I am. <laughs> Okay, so what I'll do is lift the pot up, and again, this will keep the shape from distorting, and just put it back on the bat. Okay, the next step in decorating the pot is to do the carving that I want to do. Um, there are innumerable ways to decorate of uh, pottery uh, and this I'm just going to be showing you one way that I do the decoration. I use a number of tools to do this. Um, I have natural leaves and cookie cutters and pieces of wood, shells, things like that that I use with my clay. I also have a number of different clay tools that I use to to decorate the clay. Um, everybody decorates their final pot in, in a different way and that's why uh, there's so much variety in what pottery ends up looking like. Um, this pot is going to have a carved leaf pattern on it. Uh, it'll be six leaves so I first need to kind of map out the pot and determine where the leaves are going to be. So again, I have a real scientific tool. It's a mountain high yogurt container that I've made. I've marked different lines around the edge of it. And I just use this to mark off the, the different divisions of the pot. So I'm gonna divide it into sixths around the pot. So there's the basic sixths, and then I'll divide each of these into quarters so I can gauge how the leaves flow around the pot. Okay, now I'm using a tool that has a very fine, it's a wire tool, has a fine point on it to make, to carve the initial design. You have to be aware of the thickness of the pot as you're doing this. Don't want to carve so deeply that you actually carve through the 
wall of the pod. Okay, and now I'll switch to a different tool that has a square end in the wire um, to, to make an, a different type of carving. So now you see there's a lot of kind of crumbles of clay and I want to get those off before I sponge everything smooth. So I take a brush that has real stiff bristles and just brush away some of the crumbles. Okay, that's good enough. Uh, so now I want to smooth this. There's a lot of rough edges and I want to smooth it so it's nice and smooth when you feel it. So this is where I take my sponge and just go over the carving. This takes off any other little rough crumbles and, and smooths the edges of the carving. Okay, and that's good. That's cleaned it up considerably. Okay, so I have a theory when I make my pots that I like to have them look beautiful and interesting from all angles. And so right now we have a nice finished foot and we have a very interesting outside of the pot. But what are we going to do to the rest of the pot? So this is where I have to flip the pot over so I can do some decoration on the inside of the pot and on the lip of the pot. Okay, so I'll put another bat on top and just flip it over. Again, I didn't want to pick it up because I might distort the shape of the pot. So now we have the top edge of the pot. And I like to finish this um, so it looks a little roughly like the edge of a leaf. So I'll take a, a knife, a small knife, and start cutting the edge of the pot. And 
then I'm going to cut the back part here a little bit more too. Okay, so you can see it's starting to look a little ruffly. Again, there's quite a sharp edge around all this, so I'll go around and smooth off the edge a little bit with the knife. Okay, and now the final smoothing will be with the sponge. All right, so, so now the edge is smooth. So that's an interesting edge on the piece, but what about the inside? You can see the inside of the pot is kind of bland looking right now. So I do a little bit of carving on the inside too. So it's kind of an abstract flower design that I put in there. I don't like to put it right in the center of the pot because that can be a little boring too. Um, so I put it off to the side a little bit and then just, I don't want to make the carving too thick because you're thinking this is used for food and you don't want the carving to be too deep so that food would get stuck in it. So it's, when the pot is finally fired, you can hardly even feel this carving, but the glaze knows that the carving is there and will pool in it. So it ends up being a white on white design on the inside of the pot. And then I'll take the square-ended tool And now I have to smooth it with the sponge. Okay, so now that adds a little bit of design on the inside. And the final step with this is to make the lip a little bit ruffly. So I'll just go around the edge. It's still very flexible. And turn some of it in, turn some of it out to make the edge a little bit ruffly. There we go. So that's the final shape. So, at this point then, the bowl needs to dry. And dry completely. And it's important to remember that as a, uh, as a pot dries, it shrinks. And so you want to try to dry the pot evenly so that uh, there's not undue stress put on the pot while it's drying. So the best way for a bowl to dry is actually turned upside down on its rim, so, so it'll dry completely from all angles on the outside. If I lift, left it this way to dry, the, the rim would dry very quickly and the bottom would still be wet, and that puts a lot of stress on the piece. So I'm going to let this rim stabilize just a little bit because it's still quite soft from all the sponge work that I've done. But once it's a little bit um, harder, 
Then I'll flip the pot over to dry completely. Well, now the piece is completely dry. You can see it's a much lighter color. This is called the greenware stage. Um, the piece is very delicate, eggshell delicate. Uh, it could break very easily, so you have to handle it carefully. At this point, if you added water to the clay, you could actually reconstitute the clay and make something else out of it. Uh, so that's, that's one of the properties of the greenware. So it is ready to be fired now. The first firing that I do is called the bisque firing. And what this firing does is uh, partially solidify the clay so that you can handle it very easily. You don't have to worry about marring the surface. And, but it's still very um, absorbent to water. So when you dip it in the glaze, for example, to glaze the piece, the glaze will stick to the pot and absorb into the clay. So let's go into my kiln room and we'll put it in the kiln, we'll load it in the kiln for the bisque firing. Okay, so here's my kiln that I use to fire the pottery. Uh, it's an electric kiln. Um, a lot of potters um, fire their kilns with other type of uh, combustible. Um, some use oil, some use propane, some use wood. Um, I've chosen to use electric just because I'm in an urban setting and it's easier to do it that way. So uh, when you stack the kiln, you have shelves that you can put the pottery on to completely fill the kiln. So I'll just place this piece here at the top of the kiln. When you're firing the kiln, you want to keep track of the temperature that the kiln is firing to. And a way you do that is by using what's called a pyrometric cone. With each firing, I place three cones in front of the peephole here so that I can peek in during the firing and see how the firing is progressing. The first cone I put in is the cone below where I want the firing, final firing temperature to be. So I'll put that one in first. And then the second cone is the final firing temperature. So I put that one in. And then the third cone is the one above the final firing temperature, so I, I know if it's been overfired. But as the kiln reaches the specific temperature that that cone bends at, then I'll know the, what, where we are in the firing. When I do my bisque firing, I fire to what's called a cone 04, which that temperature for me ends up being about 1,945 degrees Fahrenheit um, in the final firing. So we'll close the kiln and I'll plug the top hole and put the peephole plugs in here and then turn it on and the firing will take probably about 12 hours to get up to the top temperature. Okay, so we're ready to open the kiln. The kiln has cooled off and it's safe to open now. And the pot has been bisque fired. It has a much different feel now. It's harder, you can hear a little bit of a ring, and it's ready to be glazed. One thing I do want to show you is the, the cones. You can see the first cone is completely bent over. Um, that was the one that is the temperature before the final firing. This second cone is just starting to bend a little bit, so that's good as far as um, you know what the temperature got and this one the third cone is straight so it never got up to the top temperature or the it, ne it didn't over fire okay so let's take this and start glazing it okay so in the glazing process one of the things that you always need to do when firing at the temperature I fire at is protect some of the bottom of the pot from getting any glaze on it at all. If glaze gets on the very bottom foot ring of the pot, then when you fire it in the final firing, the, the pot will stick to the shelf. So you have to keep this bare. And I do that by putting a wax resist process onto the foot ring. Now this is, um, it, it's a wax resist, but what I've done is I've added um, some alumina to the wax resist. 
The wax keeps the glaze from sticking, but the alumina is what actually keeps the pot from sticking to the kiln shelf. So I make sure that there's no sharp edges on the clay and like where my signature is on the bottom, that feels really sharp and rough. So I just, I just take a little steel banding strap that I made into a tool and scrape on it and it takes off the rough edges. Um, and so then I'm just going to paint the wax around the edge. Now, you remember when I was trimming the pot, I left a little ridge next to the foot ring. And this is where that comes in. The ridge is kind of a guide for me to make a nice, even, and straight wax line. So I, I can just run the edge of the brush along that ridge, and it makes a nice, neat wax line. Okay, so the wax has to dry before I go any further in the glazing process. So we'll just set that aside for now. Okay, so checking the wax that I put on the bottom of the pot, it looks like it's dry enough to glaze the pot now. Um, I first, in glazing this, this piece, I dip it in a white glaze. Uh, when you're getting the glaze ready, it's kind of a, by experience, what works the best. Uh, you want to have the glaze the right thickness so that it's not too thick and would maybe melt off the pot or uh, as it's firing. Um, but you don't want it too thin either because you won't get the right color then. So I use a very scientific method to determine how thick the glaze should be. I stir it with a spoon and I count one, two, three, and the glaze stops moving on the spoon. And that's the thickness that I use. So not very scientific, but it works for me. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is dip half of this pot in the glaze and then I'll have to let it dry and then I'll dip the other half. So here we go. to dip it in five times like that. And then while the glaze is still wet, it's very easy to wipe any drips off of this foot ring. So I always clean it up after each, after each dipping. Okay, so we'll let this dry a little bit and then I'll be able to dip the remainder of the pot. Okay, so now I'm ready to dip the other half of the pot. I've only waited maybe about 10 minutes or so. Um, the glaze on the first half is not completely dry, but it's dry enough so that I can handle it and, and not leave fingerprints and stuff like that. So, so now I'll do the other half. And when I do this, what I'm trying to do, you can see there's kind of a wavy line there where the first glaze was. I'm going to overlap it a little bit so that makes a little decorative element inside the, the pot that I, that I like. Okay. And again I'll sponge off the excess. And I'm also going to kind of wipe off some of the clay where there's the overlap, just so I know it's not too thick at that overlap spot. Okay, so now that has to dry a little bit more. Okay, so the white glaze is fairly dry now, and so I'm getting ready to put the color on. Uh, this colored glaze I'm going to apply using a brush uh, and so the glaze is much thicker 
then you can see it barely drips off the brush. It's much thicker than the glaze that I dipped the pot in. And that's so that I can put a nice coating on with just one stroke of the brush. Um, this glaze, although it looks kind of a grayish color right now, will turn into a beautiful pale green color in the finish, final firing. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just paint the, the leaves that I carved on the pot. There's a lot of ways to apply glaze to a pot. I primarily use dipping and then brushing. Sometimes I'll pour the glaze over the pot, but there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Some potters use a, a spray booth and, and spray the color onto the pot. Okay, so that's the green glaze that I put on. The next color that I put on is um, a light blue color. And I use this light blue color just to give a little bit of variation to the tone, so it's not just solid green going up the side of the, the pot. There's uh, areas where it's, it has more of a blue tone to it. So again, I've done the same thing. I've taken the same white glaze I've added a coloring oxide to the white glaze so that it will turn out a blue color. And for this, I just put a little bit of the glaze in the, the lid of the pot. And then I have a, a sponge, just a small piece of sponge that I dip into the glaze. Not the entire surface, but just a little bit toward the base is where I put this, this blue glaze on each leaf. And so that makes a nice variation in the color of the leaf. So now the glaze needs to dry completely and the pot will be ready to load into the kiln for the final firing. Okay, so the glaze on the pot is dry now and it's ready to load into the kiln for the final firing. Okay, and we, uh, again, I use the cones in the kiln so that I know the temperature and when the kiln is almost up to the top temperature. 
The temperature that I do the final firing at at my kiln is what we call cone six. It, I actually end up being kind of between cone six and cone seven, but that's a temperature, a top temperature of 2,190 degrees um, in the kiln. So the first, the first cone that I put in is um, a cone number five, and then the cone six is the middle cone that I put in, so I can look at that and see when it's melted. And then the cone seven is the cone that, if that went down completely, the pot would be overfired. Okay, so we're ready to close up the kiln again. And turn it on for the, for the final firing. Okay, so this is the exciting time for the potter where you're seeing the final result of all your work. The kiln has cooled after the glaze fire and I'm ready to open it up and see how the piece turned out. And here we have a beautiful bowl that is finished. Uh, the inside you can see has has the subtle pattern. You can see where the glaze overlapped a little bit. The outside has the green leaf that I painted on the pot. So this is um, ready, except that when it first comes out of the kiln, the bottom of the pot is quite rough. And so it needs to be smoothed off. I use a piece of emery cloth. Other potters have polishing stones or other kinds of um, abrasive material that you can use. I just, since the clay I use is very, very smooth, I can just do this and it is smooth enough for the finished pot. So the pot is ready to sell so someone else can enjoy it now. <laughs>